Good morning and welcome to ADA and Accessibility with Steve Rigoli. We have a one hour class this morning and time is going to fly by. So if you notice, I put an announcement in the Q&A and in, in that I ask you to please enter your questions in the Q&A like always. We will try to get to your questions at the end of the class, but if we don't, we're going to be sending out your questions with staff answers for all of the courses that we've offered that we offer yesterday and today to all participants along with a survey at the end of this course. Uh, you should expect to see that Monday or Tuesday. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. I'm going to pass you off to Steve Rigoli, our senior architect administrator with the Board of Building Standards. Steve is an architect. He is also a longtime code administration official, a code developer, and an educator of high renown across the state of Ohio and elsewhere. Take it away, Steve. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, have your cup of coffee and you've made uh, arrangements to spend a little time without interruptions. Um, this uh, session will be an, a truncated version of what we do. This can be up to a four hour seminar. We've, uh, don't worry, we've reduced it to about an hour, a little less perhaps. And if you have questions, if you were here yesterday, you saw the uh, little slide that shows the, the um, Q&A window that you can actually type in questions because of the type of Teams presentation we're doing. You won't be able to uh, unmute yourself or use your camera, so I would encourage you and we had good participation yesterday to type in your comments. Meg will be monitoring that and then periodically she'll pop in and uh, ask one of the questions if we get it. We'll move through this section. And as I said, this is a truncated version, but it'll give you some good basic information if you're not familiar with either Chapter 11 or 3411 in the building code, deal with accessibility. We're going to raise a couple of issues that come up. We've gotten questions frequently about some of these subjects. So hopefully you have a better background on how to make buildings and facilities usable and accessible. So go ahead, Meg, and start the presentation. Your presentation is live. All right, good. When we're talking about accessibility, we really are talking about making buildings and facilities usable for Ohio citizens. And if you were to travel anywhere else in the world, you would quickly find, especially if you were uh, at an injured leg or were a little, uh, um, it was a little difficult for you to um, move around, you'd find that the United States is kind of unique and that you won't find that same accommodation often in other places in the world. In fact, you many times don't even see disabled people in the general population for a lot of different reasons. Some stigma, some the fact that um, there's no ability to be accommodated in buildings and streets and transportation and things. So we're going to start by talking about before. Before today's laws, you basically had a couple of choices. You could you could be institutionalized and dealt with for your disabilities there, or you may require personal care, professional care in a facility or in a home, but you really were limited in your ability to function independently. And that uh, presented a, a, a big opportunity to begin considering uh, accommodating, accommodating people with disabilities and mainstreaming them. As a result of that, legislation was passed at the federal level because private industry, private development, and uh, local governments just weren't making accommodation for people with disabilities to receive the services they may have been paying taxes to receive or uh, insurance to, uh, to uh, receive. So the uh, federal law changed and was mandated 
And since that, that impacted building construction, many of those provisions were incorporated into the building codes. And uh, initially, the federal government refused to use existing standards and, and wrote their own based, uh, based on research and studies and things that were already existing, but, but independent of the typical standards uh, writing process. And so as a result of that, we ended up with the American with Disabilities Act and a separate set of guidelines that were the pictures and diagrams that were mandated. In um, designing buildings, uh, over time that had, had changed and people realized that maintaining a parallel set of standards put people into, into a real bind. The Ohio Building Code that um, was based on ICC's model codes had to be adjusted. We did that independent of the model code groups and removed references to the ANSI A117.1 standard that, IB, that the IBC had historically used for accessibility because there were conflicts between it and the federal law. And our decision <clears throat> uh, at the board level was let's not use a standard that didn't comply with or match the federal requirements because that put designers of buildings and owners of buildings in jeopardy even though they could comply with the building code they were using a standard that didn't have the provisions parallel provisions in it that the federal law did and so we we were separate from the process that was being used for accessibility at the national level in the model codes until recently and icc the federal uh, uh, agencies that promulgated accessibility standards the u.s access board and justice department other states began studying the differences between ANSI A117.1 and ADAG, the Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines, and realized that they weren't too different and that if there were some changes made to ANSI, a building built according to the technical provisions in the standard would comply with the federal law. So today, the situation we're in today, that if, if you design a building, and comply with the current OBC provisions for accessibility. And if the construction is in accordance with that approved design, the facility will comply with the federal uh, and Ohio accessibility laws. So it's a safe haven, it's a default that we've been able to uh, incorporate into the codes to keep owners from being at a disadvantage when it came to accessibility. The um, process that we use is kind of a bifurcated system, meaning there are two parts for accessibility. The scoping requirements, the what, where, how many, to the, and what extent, are found in the Ohio Building Code. That's where you're going to go to find out what, where, and how many you, you uh, need that information in your design process. Once the building code directs you to what and where and how many and what features are required, then we incorporate the technical requirements from ICC NCA 117.1, the 2009 edition. So those two documents work in tandem. The ANSI document is, uh, I guess you could say, parallel to the federal ADAG, the Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines, pictures and diagrams that have the dimensions and the technical information. And the building code is going to tell you when, where, and how you're going to provide for that accessibility in a design. So we have a design manual, the how, where, what, when, and why, and the technical requirements, the how, the measurable specifications that tell you how to do that. Now, for many of you, you may have a copy of the building code, you may not. You may have a copy of ANSI A117.1, but you may not. And we've, we've asked uh, ICC and, and they, we've paid them to provide an online free source. And there are other places you can find this, but if you go to 
codes.iccsafe.org forward slash category forward slash Ohio, you're going to get something that looks similar to this. It's a virtual bookshelf. And as you scroll through the pages, you're going to find the building, fire, plumbing, mechanical, codes, Ohio energy provisions, fuel gas code, property maintenance. Uh, we don't use that, but it's there for your reference. The existing building code, there's only one section of that we use out of chapter seven. Some standards, there are some standards for bleachers, storm shelters, um, and also you'll find a copy of ANSI A117.1. So online you have free access to both the building code, the scoping requirements, and ANSI A117.1, the technical requirements, the measurable specifics. Now, as a little background or history to these requirements, it's it's important to understand that these uh, anthropomorphic dimensions were developed from studies done by HUD uh, back in the 50s. And some of the diagrams are kind of humorous because they, they actually look like something from the 50s. But you'll notice a lot of the dimensions and uh, anthropomorphic uh, measurements are the same. Uh, for instance, the dimensions for an, of an adult size wheelchair, you'll find those things look very much like the dimensions and diagrams we have today in ANSI or ADAG. For instance, the minimum space for a wheelchair to make a 180 degree turn. That was part of that original study, a five foot diameter turning space, and the clearances were based on this kind of uh, wedding cake type of uh, spherical dimensions that uh, reflected a, an adult in a wheelchair trying to make a turn and how that wheelchair, that person in a, in, in a wheelchair would approach fixtures, devices, switches and things. So you can see that what we see today in our standards was based on a 10 year study as one source HUD did, Housing and Urban Development did back in the 50s to try to understand what's needed and how someone that was uh, incapacitated in some form, had a disability, could be accommodated in buildings. And you can see these, uh, these um, comparisons. Height limits and, and reach ranges, that also was part of this study. And you'll see that common 15 inch, 48 inch max reach ranges for a uh, forward reach on an uh, uh, unobstructed reach on a wheelchair. Those all came out of those studies done back in the 50s. And, and as a result of all the studies, the dimensions, the work that was done, you'll see some things uh, that are very consistent with requirements in the building code as far as uh, any, any uh, accessible outlets, switch heights, control heights, all in accessible locations, the clear floor areas, all of those things that make the spaces we build uh, accessible and accommodating to people with disabilities. And if they're not difficult to do, but once we understand the limitations, the, the anthropomorphic limitations, we can design spaces that accommodate. So what we're gonna do is uh, look at some processes. One is, uh, for instance, on uh, some hints about review of these construction documents that are going to incorporate the accessibility requirements. And, and as I would say, either in the design phase or in the plan review phase, it's a very simple suggestion. Review in a sequence. Start with arrival. In this particular case, we have a bus stop, we have a parking lot. So we have some arrival points that we understand are part of the accessible route to the, these uh, places of public accommodation. You can see the two buildings in uh, um, plan view uh, at the top of that picture. So I'm going to uh, first understand where my arrival points are, provide the appropriate parking spaces, curb cuts, etc. I'm going to follow that into the uh, internal circulation, the, the connected access route. I'm going to make sure that 
in plan review or in design. I've made provision for those things, slopes, um, changes in elevation, those types of things. Then I'm going to look at the numbers of things like parking spaces, van spaces. Uh, if I have a, a, a drop off, uh, I, I'm going to design that according to the techno requir technical requirements in the uh, standard signage, space sizes, level access aisles, and the accessible routes all connect to accessible entrances. So when I'm doing that review, I'm going to follow the process. I'm going to look at the features and review them as they would be used. And it's just a mental check off of the different components that need to be provided. Now, in, in the scoping provisions of, chap of the Ohio Building Code, we're going to find Chapter 10 for egress is going to contain many scoping provisions for accessibility. And we're going to we're going to start there when it comes to uh, determining the accessibility requirements in my egress system. I'm also going to look at Chapter 11. That's also primarily a scoping provision. Now, Chapter 11, for instance, may not have anything in it, in it about elevators. I'll find that in 10. I'll find stairs in 10. All of those provide the designer and the plan reviewer scoping requirements for what's required in designing a building to address accessibility. And if, if you were with us yesterday on the existing buildings uh, seminar, the second, second session uh, contain a lot of information on accessibility for existing buildings when there are alterations, repairs, additions, maintenance to those buildings. So that's where I'm going to find my scoping. This is going to tell me what I have to do, how many, where they are, and then I'm going to move to this to the reference standard in Chapter 35, my ANSI A117.1 document, and that's going to be the how to do what the building code required as far as scoping. That's the technical requirements, the basic concepts and elements, the kind of building blocks that I that I can build in response to the scoping requirements that say I have to do this, this is how many of those I have to do, and the reference standards will tell me how. It will give me some specific technical information on routes, spaces, devices, fixtures, and specific elements related to residential uses and recreational facilities that I need, and I need to understand how to do that. The building code will, will indicate when I have to have, for instance, accessible units in a residential occupancy, um, when I have to have type A units or type B units, the standard will give me the specifics of what's required in those units to assure that that design complies with the scoping requirements and complies with uh, ultimately with as a safe haven and complies with the federal laws. A few definitions. One is accessible. And, and the shorthand is it complies with Chapter 11. It, it's it's a, a building facility or portion that complies with the, the code requirements. I've designed it in such a way that it is shown to be in compliance with the accessibility requirements in Chapter 11. Also accessible route, that's a continuous unex unobstructed path that also complies with Chapter 11. Again, the scoping provisions of the code are going to help me determine what needs to be accessible and how I move through that building along an accessible route. A circulation path can be interior or exterior, and it's how I get from place to place. That path, that circulation path, is how the um, occupants are going to be moving either in an in, in exterior or an exterior passageway or path of travel from one place to another. The key definition, and we talked about this yesterday, was primary function. 
And this is important because it impacts what has to be made accessible or what I have to get access to. And the primary function is the major activity for which the facility is intended. And I know the definitions aren't supposed to be uh, contain text in them, but in the uh, world of accessibility, it, it was felt that it needed to be made clear what it is and what it isn't kind of a definition. So the definition also includes that areas that, that contain a primary function. Um, for instance, the customer service lobby of a bank, that's the public accommodation. The dining area of a cafeteria, that cafeteria dining area is the primary function. It's the accommodate area of accommodation that I have to make uh, account for people using it that might be disabled. Meeting rooms in a conference center, as well as offices, work areas that are uh, activities of the public accommodation. Now, mechanical rooms, boiler rooms, supply rooms, lounges, locker rooms, quarters and restrooms are not areas containing a primary function. Now, they may be amenities that may need to be adjusted for accommodation, but generally the boiler rooms, mechanical rooms, supply storage rooms, those types of things, janitor closets, aren't part of the primary function and aren't required to be made accessible. Now, my entrances, corridors, and restrooms are not contained, they don't contain a primary function, but are amenities or parts of a building that allow access to the primary function. So we're trying to trying to understand the components and the, the terminology to help us accurately provide accessibility in the built environment. In uh, OBC 1103.1, it's clear that we're talking about more than just a building, and this is kind of a unique um, understanding because generally the building code applies to buildings and the land incident are there too. It doesn't stretch out into the site, doesn't stretch out to include, for instance, the um, building sewer. My, the building drain is covered, but once I leave the building, the plumbing code ends. Mechanical code from pretty much is restrict, restricted to the exterior walls of the building. But when we're talking about accessibility, it extends well beyond the building and that's why the definition of the section in, in chapter 11 indicates makes it clear that sites buildings structures facilities elements spaces have to accommodate people with into with disabilities and that's a, a pretty broad statement so understanding arrival points accessible routes um, accessible entrances, all of those requirements helps us build the accessibility features from the arrival points to the to the basically the primary function and the routes to get there. So we're going to start with the overall requirements that every building structure facility must be uh, must uh, be accessible, and then explain some exceptions. Um, so we'll say these are required for every building, but we understand there are some exceptions and uh, we'll look at some of those things. Now, the primary exceptions in 1103, uh, there are several that I think are, are understandable. Employee work areas could be uh, very difficult to be to make accessible and then there's a separate section of the federal law that's outside the scope of the building code that deals with employment so employers have other provisions for employee work areas that are outside the scope of the building code so the building code simply says i need to get access to into and from those areas and you you, you can see this in many sections of the building code in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Also exempt from these requirements would be attached 1, 2, and 3 family dwellings. The federal law never intended, nor did the old Fair Housing Amendment Act ever intend to reach into uh, individuals' domicile, their, their 
their castle. So none of the accessibility requirements apply to one, two, or three families. Now the residential code does have in it, I can hear Jay Richards on our staff raising his hand and, and say yes, but the residential code says if however you do incorporate accessible features into a one, two, or three family dwelling, the residential code says those features have to be built in a way that complies with the accessibility requirements in, in ANSI 117.1. Also exempt are group U structures, and this is these are generally structures not open to the public, uh, agricultural structures, garages and carports. It's understood that those uh, the, those themselves don't have to be accessible. If it's a garage, I might have to have a route to the garage, but the garage itself and most used structures, since they're not open to the public, don't uh, aren't required to be made accessible, uh, good, uh, as well as construction sites. Structures associated with the actual construction of a building, it's recognized, should be accepted from the accessible uh, the accessibility requirements. They're either temporary or the construction sites, not a place for, where public will be accommodated. These are these are basically work areas, as well as raised areas. There are some uh, raised areas either for security, life safety fire safety, those raised areas are exempt guard towers. Uh, there are some um, toll booths that are out in the lanes of traffic on islands. Those raised areas in churches, for instance, and courts, even though they're small, they're limited in size, have some exceptions. The um, limited access and equipment spaces, and we already talked about that, that's like the mechanical rooms and um, the uh, toll booths and those types of things again. Uh, R1 facilities, um, oh, we did, the, I forgot to mention this, we talked about it briefly, but there's a specific uh, exemption for raised or lowers, lowered areas in churches, but there is a, there is a square footage limit. Uh, toll booths, talked about that. R1 facilities, now this is an interesting one, understand that R1, some R1 facilities are exempt, and those are those small owner-occupied R1s. We could see things like uh, bed and breakfasts. Um, they're owner-occupied, and because they're owner-occupied, they're dealt with more like a detached one, two, and three family, and there's some special provisions for, for those. Uh, daycare in, de in detached dwellings, Areas not used for care. Um, jails and prisons. Common areas not serving accessible cells because in jails or prisons there have to be a percentage of cells that are accessible and the common areas serving those have to be accessible. But uh, those other places in uh, jails and prisons that are not serving accessible cells don't have to be accessible. Walk in coolers or freezers without public access considered more like employee work areas than they are since they're not open to the public. There's no accommodation um, for those spaces. Existing buildings and um, chapter 34 deals a lot with existing buildings and the limits that can be placed on the accessibility requirements. We went through that yesterday in a little more detail, but it's something to, um, to be aware of. Now we're going to look at some things here to kind of point out overall the typical elements and features and how an accessible route works because people get confused by this. So we're just going to look at a, a process of evaluating these things. First, obviously there's access to the site. And again, as I said, the building code uniquely for accessibility does reach out into the site and this deals with uh, curb cuts and curb ramps, you'll see those in a couple of places here. Walks and surfaces, most people don't understand that there are passing spaces that are needed on um, uh, um, walks and, surf, pa uh, walks and uh, horizontal surfaces. So I may, in designing these, these uh, sidewalks, if they're narrow, 
They may need to be. I may have to incorporate passing spaces. The surfaces of these walks and and this this um, accessible route are a consideration because I'm going to I'm going to make sure they're level flat and there's even some some uh, slopes that have to be maintained in order for them to be considered flat and they have to be able to drain so there is a um, side to side slope that I can add within parameters. So once I've I've ex I've looked through my what is basically access to the site, then I'm going to consider um, those arrival points. I've got parking here. I don't see a bus stop, but I do have a, a parking lot provided. So when I provide parking, I'm going to provide that that accessible parking connects to an accessible route. And here you can see an accessible parking space with an access aisle that connects me to the accessible route on the site. We're going to have to consider level changes and those things you can see in this example. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a ramp included to accommodate a change in level in addition to stairs. We're going to then look at the internal ac accessible route because I need to deal with those level changes, um, connecting my exterior spaces and those common or public use spaces that I might have outside my building. Now that I've I've accomplished those, I'm going to I'm going to look that to, to assure that I have an accessible entrance and then an accessible route interior to the building. If I have retail space, if I have access to elevators that will get me to other floors in the building to make sure that I have public and common use spaces that are attached to a public route like these restrooms and I have the ability to provide accommodation for people that will need to use those restrooms. I'm also going to uh, review the stairwells and areas of um, rescue assistance so that I can assure people that use this space that in an emergency and the elevators are shut down, you'll see this area of rescue assistance top center pointed out in the in the stairwell that I have a, a, a attached that to the public, uh, the accessible route within the building. All of these different components then will assure these typical elements and common features are built into the building and with uh, minimum a adjustment, I can make accommodation to uh, the public in this public accommodation, this facility that I'm offering for public accommodation. Another uh, way to look at an entire site, not just one building, but oftentimes we may have multiple buildings on a site. And again, we're going to start our process by looking at our arrival points. Now, if I have public transportation, do I have an arrival point on my site that will within the boundary of the site that will connect me to my accessible entrances? Can I get from this arrival point or these parking spot arrival points to my accessible entrances? Not all of these entrances appear to be accessible. You notice back here where the tennis court is, you see some stairs. But for these building entrances, I need to make sure I can get from my public transportation or my arrival points to the accessible entrance. And you can see some accessible parking spots marked out by the diagonal hash marks. You can see that there's a curb cut and I can get to my accessible entrance. Now, some of these, these entrances are inaccessible. It's not practical, it's impractical to regrade or adjust the design of the building to accommodate them, but I can get into each building through, its, through a common building entrance and get access to um, the facility, the public accommodation. There are public amenities here. I've got a play, a picnic area playground, 
at the lower center. I've got a swimming pool and a clubhouse. There are jogging trails that that uh, are attached to or near the tennis courts. All of those have to be accessible. Now the jogging trail, there may be some impracticality, but the part that is practical should be um, accessible. The pool has an accessible route. You can see here it's been graded to allow people access to the pool and the playground. You can see coming off of the parking lot to the lower right, I have a, an accessible route to it. I'm also going to consider um, whether these are these buildings um, connect to covered dwellings because in this residential building some of the dwelling units may not be regulated by the the accessibility requirements but some will if there are entrance uh, entrances that are inaccessible uh, we try as best we can to, to um, eliminate some of these impractical um, entrances where accessibility is impractical is what I mean to say. And if these tennis courts, for instance, aren't accessible, there may have to be a pedestrian route, a road or accessible parking to make those public amenities accessible. So a lot of this planning has to be done to assure if I'm going to provide amenities, I can I can make them accessible where uh, accessible entrances or building entrances are impractical to make accessible. I can find alternate routes into the building. There are unelevated building requirements that can kick in. Um, portions of a building may not have to be um, accessible because a building is not required to be uh, elevated under all conditions. Designated parking spaces for visitors and residents. And um, in a building like this, it's used as an example of the fact that if it's unelevated, this is three stories, so it doesn't have to have an elevator, but all of the ground floor units do have to be accessible, have to be on an accessible route. And uh, we're going to come in, we're going to talk about some special conditions when uh, an elevator may be required uh, in a similar situation. And then lastly, understand that access routes between buildings with covered units um, aren't required unless connecting site facilities. So if I can get from my public transportation or my arrival point to a building, unless there are amenities provided, getting from building A to building B to building C um, isn't necessarily required, but if there, but there needs to be arrival points to each building, accommodation for those arrival points, and access to a common building entrance that's accessible. And you can see here between these two buildings, they'll provide individual, two buildings at the top, right? Each building is required to have uh, parking if it's provided. And once it's provided, I have to get from the accessible parking to the accessible entrance. And if it's not an elevated building, all of those ground floor units are required to be accessible and uh, the building code is going to give you the scope of of those requirements and the standard is going to give you the technical dimensions and data on how to comply. Anyway, this happens many times and we get questions often about that. I wanted to show you an example of uh, what we just discussed and this is a multi-story building on a sloped site that has um, some issues that need to be understood. First, if I have stairs serving, and you'll see here the numbers, units four and six up on the second floor, um, those units up there are not covered units. They don't have to comply. And the at-grade units, which establishes a ground floor, 
those units have to be accessible, meaning the units themselves have to be accessible depending on the numbers, type A, type B, or an accessible unit. I have to provide the, the appropriate parking access and access to my building, uh, my accessible entrances. Having established that ground floor, anything that's not part of the ground floor or that's impractical, like the unit three upstairs or um, unit five on the end, it's impractical to put in a chairlift or a long enough ramp here to get access to um, unit five. So in this example, units one and two establish a ground floor. Those units are required to be accessible. The types of units are required to um, comply as required. Those inaccessible units, six, four, three, and five, are not um, uh, accessible. But the building, this building, would comply with um, the accessibility requirements as designed. So the first thing you're going to do whenever you're looking at a building is establish the ground floor. And that gets to be a little tricky. We're going to look at a couple of examples that um, will maybe illustrate that. For instance, in this case, I've got stairs to non-covered units, and you'll see here 9, 10, 3, 5, and 6 are upstairs, and I've accessed them by stairways at each end of the building. One here to the right is a stair, and at the top center is another stair serving units, unit 10. So 3, 5, and 9 are served by this stair, and unit 10 is served by this stair. I have established a ground floor and that brings with the, the requirement to provide an arrival point, an accessible route, and accessible entrances to these accessible units. Now in this case, because unit four, I'm sorry, unit six, I'm, no, I'm, I, I apologize, unit four has access at grade from some parking here and an accessible route coming in from the upper left through a sidewalk at grade. Unit four is, is also covered by an ex, the requirement for an accessible entrance. Unit six, however, which has a stair that goes up to it, is not a covered unit. I have established a ground floor. Once I've established that, all the units on the ground floor or that can be re, uh, entered at grade are covered units. I have to have a distribution and the number of types of units. Those that are inaccessible, either being accessible by stairs or say a, um, an impractical site condition, are not covered. They're not, uh, don't have to be made accessible. But the accessible entrances for covered units seven and eight will have to be done because the stairway at one end of the building serves Unit 10, it's not required to be accessible. And, and this, is, uh, this is one of those nuances you have to understand. Accessibility for four or more units with at grade access. Uh, this, for instance, this building is four units. This is the one to the left. It's a carriage building with garages under. And you may see this sometimes. Because there is a grade a, a, a one unit at grade um, where I've got four or more units in a, in a building, the accessibility provisions are going to be triggered. Now, an interior accessible route to a garage isn't required to these carriage units, but there is a requirement for visitor parking and for and access to that garage on a route from the entrance. This attached single story unit establishes a ground floor so that any units at the ground floor are required to be accessible and would be covered by the accessibility requirements. These three single story units over the private uh, one or two car garages 
are not required to be accessible. Now, if I remove this grade floor unit and add another unit like illustrated to the right, I have to establish a ground floor, which would be that dwelling unit floor. Now I'm triggering potentially either a ramp requirement or an elevator requirement because I've got to have access. I have to establish a ground floor, which would be this level. If the single floor at grade unit wasn't there, this building to the right would then have to provide access to the um, dwelling units and establish a, a ground floor. So, but because I've provided an at grade, an at grade unit here, these over garage units are non covered units and this is ties into the old Fair Housing Amendments Act that was um, in place for many years back in the 90s and when ANSI developed their standards, uh, the type B and type A units more reflect, well the type B units reflect the old Fair Housing Amendments Act guidelines. And again, we can get ourselves into some real problems if we ignore the fact that I have to establish a ground floor a grade level floor and then apply the accessibility requirements for those units that are covered. If I do commercial build, commercial down below and put all my dwelling units up and there are more than four units, those units upstairs have to have an accessible route and provide be provided with um, access. In 3411, there is a stipulation that when I'm in an existing building, and this we talked about yesterday, and I'm altering less than 50% of that residential building, that I don't have to make those units adaptable. But when I exceed 50% of the area that's altered, those apartments now are required to be type B units. And it's a, it's a recognition that if I'm not altering more than 50%, I may be doing that because structurally and physically it's difficult to expand the areas of units to uh, provide some of the clearances. But once I get more than 50%, I'm doing enough work that I should be able to provide type B units that are adaptable with the right door clearances, uh, reach uh, clearances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There also must be maintained accessible, and the provisions don't impose greater accessibility required for new construction. And so, understanding existing buildings, the uh, the laws do make some allowances and some considerations you wouldn't find in new construction and change to a building are not allowed to reduce existing accessibility. So when you're dealing with existing buildings, there are some additional considerations in plan review and in design. 3411.9, which it deals with historic buildings, um, indicates that they have to comply unless, and uh, because historic buildings are, are unique and the um, Historical Societies and the, and the National Register of Historic Places put some very stringent requirements on historic buildings. There is some consideration that it might be technically infeasible to make those accommodations in a historic building. You have to look at that definition for uh, technical and feasible. We talked about that yesterday. But if compliance would destroy the historic significance, then there's some adjustment made. Uh, then we we still require an accessible route from the site arrival to an accessible entrance and an accessible route from the accessible entrance to public spaces on that level and an accessible main entrance. There are two exceptions to that accessible main entrance. Uh, you have to look through 3411.9 and signage for entrances. I may have to direct people to
to another entrance that is used for accessibility since the main level because of stairs or other restrictions can't be made accessible. The acknowledgement is that I may have to put signage up and get someone to another location to get access to the building. I wanted to also mention in 34.11.4, and uh, this deals with existing buildings, and this is buildings or portions of buildings with changes of occupancy. Again, we talked about this a little, but it needs to uh, be part of this discussion. These three sections are really important. 3411.6, 3411.7, and 3411.8 are critical when you're dealing with changes of occupancy or portions of, in portions of buildings or entire changes of occupancy. And these three sections bring into the code some language that um, initially the model code didn't do a good job of representing. And we, we brought them from the American with Disabilities Act guidelines. Buildings have to have the following features. An accessible entrance, an accessible route from the entrance to the primary function area, signage, and if you provide parking, accessible parking, if you provide a passenger loading zone, an accessible passenger loading zone, and an accessible route from the parking to the entrance. That's generally required in all buildings, whether it's a change of occupancy or not. When I do an addition, if I'm adding to the height and the square footage of the building, that work has to be done in accordance with the uh, new construction provisions and the new and the uh, accessibility requirements in Chapter 11. When the addition affects access to primary function in an existing building, there are some considerations that have to be made. If I put an addition on and now an, a, a path of travel is being altered, we're going to look at 3411.7 for some language that will apply in that condition. And it's a kind of a unique provision. Alterations, again, are going to be done in, in, in conformance with new construction. I'm going to get some information out of 34.11.7 and 8. And it's recognized that in an existing building, there may be times it's technically infeasible to do something because of the structure, the materials used, the, the limits on moving things like structure and walls and stairs. So then for existing buildings, alterations, I'm going to make accommodation to the extent possible. And this is a deliberate, iterative process that needs to happen between the owner, the designer, and the building department to make it clear what is felt to be technically infeasible and there's some reasonable justification for it. Just because it's hard to do doesn't mean it's infeasible. But structurally, mechanically, it might be infeasible, uh, site conditions, etc. Where a space or element isn't required to be on an accessible route. And remember, we talked about some of those spaces like mechanical rooms and storage rooms. That is an exception, obviously, to making the entire building accessible. And the accessible means of egress has some exceptions for alterations in existing buildings. And you're going to need to study these provisions. But just understand there's some there's some accommodation made or I don't want to use an accessibility term. There is some acknowledgement there. There is um, some consideration need to be given for these spaces in existing buildings. And again, owner occupied R2 type A units, condos, for instance, are allowed to meet type B provisions, meaning they are uh, convertible. They will they will be um, able to be made accessible. The blocking is there for for um, grab bars and, and other other devices. The doorways are able to be um, 
uh, traversed with people uh, with because they have the right clearances because they're owner occupied. Again, that's that's a that's a um, acknowledgement that this is an owner occupied, not a uh, rentable transit or, or a non apartment kind of a, a condition where people are leasing space. 34.11.7 talks about area alterations in primary function areas, and it makes a pretty bland, a, a blatant statement that if I'm altering a primary function, then I've got to get to that primary function, and I've got to make the amenities serving that area accessible. So things like toilet rooms, drinking fountains, um, not so much anymore, but phones along the way to the primary function area that's being altered have to be made accessible. And again, because this is in Chapter 3411, this is a very important provision for existing buildings and an acknowledgement that we have to add some exceptions. Yeah, you have got a question, Meg? I was actually going to just point out that you have about five minutes left. Yep, and I've only got a couple more slides. Perfect. The exceptions are dealing with disproportionality, and that's something you're going to want to read. There's a definition, and alterations limited to windows, doors, receptacles, none of those things are required to uh, be done. Uh, and made it accessible, they're, they're minor. The key here is cost disproportionality because if I make an alteration and I, I, I need to know how I can claim something as disproportionate, meaning the cost to do this is disproportionate to the amount of work I'm doing in this alteration. And what the code does is use a 20% number. When additional work is required by these sections, and this has to do with alterations, additions, and um, change of occupancy, I need to look at the cost. I'm what is the cost of doing the alteration, repair, whatever it is. What is the cost? Twenty percent of that I am required to spend toward making the building accessible, and that means accessible entrances, routes, restrooms, telephone, drinking fountains, etc. So the, the code acknowledges that um, I'm going to look at the cost it I have to, uh, the, the, the dollars I have to spend for my entrance, my route, my restrooms, my telephones, drinking fountains, etc. And I'm going to look at the cost of the alteration to the primary function area. And I'm going to find out what 20% of the cost is to those alterations I'm making to the primary function. And then I'm going to look at the costs I need to spend for the entrance, the route, telephones, restrooms, drinking fountains. And a simple mathematical calculation, if that is more than 20%, the 20% I've determined of the cost of making the alterations, then I have to spend them in a, those 20% dollars in a certain way. To do all of those things would be disproportionate. So I'm going to first spend money on an accessible entrance. And if there's money left over, I'm going to spend it on making that route to the altered primary function accessible. If there are any dollars left, then I get to talk about restrooms. And if there's only a few dollars left, it may mean things like I'm only able to put in handrails, um, sorry, grab bars, protect, perhaps protect the plumbing under the sink. And, and, and the code gives you a list of things in existing buildings when there are alterations on the amount of money to be spent and the priority in which it should be spent. The scoping for specific facilities and elements, there's some specific, about 15 items that uh, we have to understand 
have some unique scoping requirements that are that, that give me more information, specific requirements in 3411, which is where we should, in the building code, find these specific scoping. It has to do with entrances, elevators, courtrooms. You can see this list. There are about, I don't know, I think it's 15. 12 or so items that there are specific requirements for that will give you some scoping when we're dealing with um, those components. Anyway, I want to thank you. And if there are any questions, Meg, did you get any questions? This was a fast flyover of a topic that we can spend hours and hours discussing. Steve, we do have some questions, but we are out of time. Uh, and so I'm going to have uh, export those to a document for you to be able to answer the questions and we'll be emailing all the participants of our continuing education, the Q&A from all of the live event sessions. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all very much for participating. We appreciate your questions. We appreciate um, your close attention on this very important topic. This is the 30 year anniversary of the ADA, and uh, it's about time that it's being recognized as, you know, law. So we appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Next class is 930 uh, existing buildings for residential with Jay Richards.